Some Writer, Chapter 6, A Time of Enchantment. When I got a place in the country, I was quite sure animals would appear, and they did. Okay, and this chapter starts out by saying, Andy became restless. He told Catherine he wanted to be more than a successful New York writer. In an article about the Great Depression, Andy wrote, The hope I see for the world is to simplify life. His parents had died within a short time of each other. World War II was underway. Andy had recently been criticized for writing about the war, but not offering any solutions. He was uneasy with the celebrity of writers in New York City and frustrated with the New Yorker's policy. Um, that editorial writers had to write from the point of view of we. He didn't like having articles sound as if they were from more than one person. And he wanted to write from his own point of view about whatever he wanted, and he wanted to do it in Maine. Disenchanted, he took a year off and went by himself to Maine to write my year, as he called it. But he wrote only one long poem. When he returned to New York, Annie convinced Catherine that they could both work from Maine. Joel would attend the local two-room schoolhouse. Within a few days of Annie's announcing he was leaving New York and the New Yorker, although he agreed to continue editing news breaks, the editors of Harper's Magazine asked him if he would write essays from Maine for the magazine. They'd call his column One Man's Meat. He had to write only one piece every month, and more important, he could write about anything and everything that interested him. In Maine, Annie composed his essays for Harper's while tending the animals, slinging his barn, fishing with Joel. The best writing, he said, is often done by persons who are snatching time from something else. Joel liked their new life in Maine, too. There was time for skating, sledding, and sailing. Andy rigged a rope swing in the barn for Joel and built him his first boat, a flat-bottomed scow named Flounder. The boat plans came from a book Andy had kept since childhood. When his parents asked Joel what the biggest difference was between his school and country and his school and city, he answered that Maine, in Maine, the days went by just like lightning. So Joel's really happy in the country. And he has a dog named Raffles. And in this picture, he's pulling a berry basket. It's so cute. And here's a diagram of the boat that they built. And E.B. White says, I have discovered rather too late in life that there's nothing so much fun as building a boat. The best thing about building a boat is that it allows absolutely no time for writing. There isn't a minute to spare. <laughs> so he's getting a break from writing. The scout was Joe's first solo experience with the water. I built her from a picture in American Boy Handy Book using pluck in place of know-how. And when she glided into the frog pond and Joe dancing around, it was my finest hour. So the boat actually floated and worked. And he didn't really know what he was doing, so he's proud of himself. Then it says here, part of Catherine's, his wife's job at the New Yorker was reviewing children's book for a column she titled Children's Shelf. Review copies poured into the White's farmhouse. Books were piled everywhere, inside cupboards, under cushions, on stair landings. In an essay for Harper's, that's a magazine, called Children's Books, Andy wrote that he'd found himself flat on his stomach reading about how to build a treehouse. The final touch was to include a small radio. Andy wrote, It must be a lot of fun to write for children. Reasonably easy work, perhaps even important work. When Andy was growing up, he read with a passionate interest all the books by William J. Long, a naturalist who wrote about animals in the wilds of Maine. But as an adult, he found most of the children's books dull, except for one, The 500 Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins by Dr. Seuss. This book seemed to him be in the true spirit of nonsense. Andy's essay about children's book caught the eye of Dr. Seuss. So Dr. Seuss read his article, and then Dr. Seuss sent it to Ann Carroll Moore. Ann Carroll Moore was a book reviewer and the children's librarian at the New York Public Library on Fifth Avenue, the library where the famous statues of two lions sit outside in the library from which Andy had taken out books as a boy. And that's a huge famous library, and if um, the librarian there promotes your books, it's definitely a big deal. After Moore read the Harper's essay, she sent Catherine and Andy a letter urging Andy to write a children's book. 
she tells him. I feel sure you could, if you would, and I assure you the library lions would roar with all their praise. And he didn't want to be prodded, like he didn't want someone telling him what to do. But he happened to have that story about a mouse tucked away in a drawer. He later wrote Charles Thurber, that was his friend at The New Yorker, and he's now the famous cartoonist, that he had half a children's book done. Months later, Aunt, months later Andy sent an unfinished manuscript to Gene Saxton, the editor at Harper and Brothers. And he told him that it would be for children, but he's fussed, I'm not too fussy about who reads it. You'll be shocked and grieved to discover that the principal character in the story has somewhat the attributes and appearance of a mouse. But Saxon was not grieved. He wasn't. He was hardly wait to read it. But it would be another six years before Stuart Little was born. And here's some of his notes and beginning writing on Stuart Little. It's an early draft. And here's a picture of life in Maine. And E.B. Wright wrote. And this is one man's meat, the column that he got to write. This is one of the things he wrote. Once in everyone's life, there is apt to a period when he is fully awake instead of half asleep. I think of those five years in Maine as the time when this happened to me. Confronted by new challenges, surrounded by new acquaintances, including the characters in the barnyard who were later to appear in Charlotte's Web, I was suddenly seeing, feeling, and listening as a child sees, feels, and listens. It was one of those rare interludes that can never be repeated, a time of enchantment. I am fortunate indeed to have had the chance to get some of it down on paper. So, those five years in Maine really helped his writing. And then he writes, Stuart Little, my innocent tale of the quest for beauty. And then it says, during World War II, um, many people who were working at the New Yorker left the magazine to help with the war effort. Harold Ross was so understaffed that Annie and Catherine moved back to New York for a time to keep, help him keep the magazine running. Joel went to a private school in New Hampshire. Catherine nagged Andy to finish Stuart Little. And Carol Moore, that's the New York librarian, so his wife is nagging him, the New York librarian is nagging him. And when his editor nagged Andy about getting the book out, Andy wrote back to him, I would rather wait a year than publish a bad children's book, as I have too much respect for children. But as time went on, the news of the war and the move back to New York in his own writing made Andy anxious and nervous. He said his help felt, felt as if it was a kite caught in the branches somewhere and mice in his subconscious. <laughs> he described how he felt at a particular low point. I was almost sure I was about to die. My head felt so queer. So he doesn't like being back in New York and he's got something in his mind that he's got to get out. On the off chance that he was about to die, Andy wanted to finish his children's book so Catherine and Joel would have enough money to live on. Meanwhile, his editor had died. Just eight weeks after moving back to New York, Andy sent the finished manuscript of Stuart Little to his new editor, and her name is Ursula Nordstrom. Ursula wrote, Only another's children's books editor can know the emotions one has on hearing that a famous writer of adult books is going to send a book for children. For talent in the former does not always carry over to the latter. So just because you're good at writing adult books doesn't mean you're good at writing children's books. But she was relieved after she read Andy's manuscript. I love the diminutive hero and I knew and I knew children would. So this is about Stuart Little. She loved him, tiny little hero. And she knew children would. And there's a copy of the first pages, the first manuscript. And then it talks about how she let him help pick the um, illustrator. That, don't, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you write and they just tell you what your illustrator is going to be. But he really likes the illustrator whose name was Garth Williams. A few days after Stuart Little came out, Andy's boss, Harold Ross, barged in his office. Saw your book, White. You made one serious mistake. Ross told him he should have said that Stuart was adopted, not born into the little family. Maybe the worst criticism of them all came from the librarian, Francis Clark Sayers, Moore's recent successor. Oh, so there's a new librarian at the New York Public Library who stamped on it, not recommended for purchase by expert. Other librarians, ban other libraries banned it too. 
E.B. White began to wonder if he had made a mysterious mistake. But what did the real experts think? Letters from children started pouring in. One of the thousands Andy received had only two questions. Only two questions. Sorry. Of all the thousands Andy received, only two questioned how Stuart came into the world. Though many were uncertain about the ending, most loved the book. March 11th, 1946. Dear Mr. White, we have just finished your book, Stuart Little. Our school librarian asked us to read it to help decide whether it would be a good book for the library. We think it would be, in fact. We think you stopped too soon. We'd like a continuation of the story. Sincerely yours, the seventh grade. Children were proving Stuart Little to be a classic in the making. From Stuart Little. In the loveliest town of all, where the, where the houses were white and high and the elm trees were green and higher than the houses, where the front yards were wide and pleasant and the backyards were bushy and worth finding out about, where the street sloped down to the stream and the stream flowed quietly under the bridge, where the lawns ended in orchards and the orchards ended in fields and the fields ended in pastures and the pastures climbed the hill and disappeared over the top toward the wonderful wide sky. In this loveliest of all towns, Stuart stopped to get a drink of sarsaparilla. And that's a kind of a drink. And here he is getting it. <laughs> the general store. There's Stuart Little. It's unnerving to be told you're bad for children, Annie confessed, but he learned two things from writing Stuart Little. A writer's instinct is his best guide, and children can sail easily over the fence that separates reality from make-believe. A fence that can throw a librarian is nothing to a child. So follow his own instinct, he knows what's best, and also children trust them, because maybe a librarian can't believe in it, but the children can. Later in the same year, that <clears throat> same year that the book came out, Ursula wrote to tell Andy that it had sold 100,000 copies. Andy gave her a jar of caviar, a gift of 100,000 sturgeon eggs. In later editions of Stuart Little, E.B. White made one small change. The little son was not born. Stuart arrived. And here's the letter he wrote. Dear Miss Nordstrom, I feel like the millionth person through a turnstile, dazed and happy. Dear me, 100,000 books? It's a little indecent, isn't it? Yours, E.B. White. And it says over. And then on the back it says... When I recover from my 100,000 head cold, which is now upon me, I'd like to take you to Milestone Luncheon at some fashionable restaurant in celebration. You can eat 100,000 stalks of celery and I'll swallow 100,000 olives. It will be the E.B. White Ursula Nordstrom book and I'll luncheon. Aw.